everyone. My name is Sarah Gawo. I'm the librarian of the Asher Banipal Library at the Syrian Cultural Foundation. It is my privilege to participate in the Nebu Circle Lecture Series, which marks the beginning of many more insightful and engaging lectures to come. Before I introduce our lecturer today, I wanted to highlight the aim of the Nebu Circle Lecture Series. In the Annals of Ancient Assyria, the god Nebu was the Lord of Wisdom and revered as the patron deity of scribes and scholars, instilling within the heart of Assyrian civilization a profound veneration for knowledge and erudition. Under the benevolent gaze of illustrious rulers such as Ashurbanipal, a grand library arose in Nineveh, elevating the pursuit of scientific understanding to unprecedented heights. The Assyrian legacy of intellectual inquiry persisted, transcending epics and weaving its way into the fabric of history, as the Assyrians founded esteemed centers of learning, exemplified by the illustrious school of Nisibis, which propelled Islamic civilization into a golden age of enlightenment and progress. Enduring trials and tribulations, including the tumultuous First World War, the Assyrian people clung to their unquenchable thirst for knowledge, allowing their love of learning to go undiminished. In the embrace of this noble tradition, the Nebu Circle Lectures, initiated by the Assyrian Cultural Foundation, now serve as a platform for distinguished scholars to congregate, to impart their insights into the annals of, of Assyrian history, literature, language, and culture, preserving and perpetuating the brill brilliance of a civilization forever marked by its profound love for wisdom. Our speaker for today is Dr. Sargon Donabed, who is a professor of Middle Eastern history at Roger Williams University. Dr. Donabed's topic for today's lecture is Not from Urmia or Hakkari, Western Assyrian Material Culture and Language in the Early 20th Century. Dr. Donabed earned his bachelor's degree at Stonehill College. He has experience teaching at both middle and high schools, including special education, alongside his studies of ancient languages at Hellenic College in Brookline, Massachusetts. His academic journey led him to complete a master's and a doctorate in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. Complementing these achievements, he possesses a Master of Science in Anthrozoology from Canisius College and has dedicated significant time as a volunteer at an animal shelter. Dr. Donabed's passions encompass cultural heritage as well as the exploration of mythology, folklore, and wisdom literature spanning from ancient to modern times. While he focuses on contemporary issues within indigenous and margin marginalized communities, he also examines the threads of continuity connecting the past to the present. Notably, he is an expert on the enduring history of Assyria and Mesopotamian culture. After the lecture, we invite you to stay updated on the latest news and events of the Assyrian Cultural Foundation by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. These lectures will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. I'll provide you with links to all our social media channels in the chat. I also kindly request that you keep your microphones muted throughout the lecture to prevent any interruptions. Please note that failure to comply may result in being removed in this, from the Zoom session. Now I would like to hand it over to Mr. Robert De Coleta, who has helped me organize these lectures. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, everyone, and welcome, uh, Dr. Uh, Sargon Donabed. Um, we're really honored to have you with us today. Uh, I think Sarah said most of the stuff that's needed for the introduction. Just, I just wanted to add that Dr. Uh, Donabed is also the author of Reforging a Forgotten Past, Iraq and the Assyrians in the 20th Century, <clears throat> which was published by Edinburgh Press. He's also the author of Assyrians of Eastern Massachusetts, a topic that is extremely interesting, and maybe you can refer to it today. Um, I would just ask Dr. Donabad to talk a little about himself, as we had previously discussed, Dr. Sargon, um, because I think that's very interesting, and it ties into the topic today. And uh, with that, I will 
take myself off and give you the floor. Dr. Donabed, all yours. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Robert and Sarah, for the introduction. So um, I have a few things to bring forward to everybody today, and, and I hope uh, much of this will be, I think it will be fairly new material for, for most folks. Um, what I wanted to do is to, to tell a little bit of a, a, a story about typically, you know, the general view of when we look at Assyrians and, and how we typically see Assyrians uh, and, and how they are seen by, let's say, both from within the Assyrian community, but also externally from a scholarly perspective or, or simply from an, a non-Assyrian perspective. Uh, and, and when we look at sort of the building blocks of the Assyrian community, in particular in diaspora, let's say in the United States, what those building blocks are and how they are utilized to put together that vision of Assyrians is what sort of sits with us, stays with us, and becomes um, the way in which we define the Assyrian community. So uh, I want you to think about, you know, uh, for each, each one of you who's here today to think about that uh, and how, just typically how we're influenced by that. And that doesn't just go for Assyrian communities, it goes for you know, all sorts of communities uh, in the United States, uh, in different countries around the world, throughout the world. And I think for the most part, uh, what I will try to do is to spin a little bit um, of a story by giving you a little bit of um, background information and then shift us uh, to its importance and what it, what it allows for uh, if we continue to find this type of material. So uh, as Robert had mentioned, you know, how this connects to me specifically. Well, uh, I am related to some of these communities, uh, these Assyrian communities that, uh, that came to the United States. Um, the title of the talk here is, if I can pop it up on the screen for you so you can see it. Um, oops, sorry about the doorbell in the background, but the, the let's see if I can pop. Oh, apologies. There we go. Okay. I think you guys can see it now. Let me see if I can put the slideshow up. So um, essentially when we're, I was thinking about, you know, what, what I could offer to the Nebu circle, uh, I thought about the sort of the traditional way in which Assyrians are viewed, but not just from outside uh, the outside perspective, although this is a major one, right? Most people think of Assyrians as people who immigrated mostly from the Urmia and the Hikari regions. Uh, some of those folks went to the uh, the region or forced to go to Bakuba in Iraq, uh, the Bakuba refugee camp, and then from there into Baghdad, into Habania, uh, over to Kerkuk and in other areas. Now, that's that's typically, you know, the way in which many folks define the Assyrians, many scholars define Assyri the Assyrian community. And it's largely a community of, quote unquote, Nestorians, quote unquote, Church of the East folks. Um, and what it typically is, is, is simply that it's, it's Urmi Haikari, um, maybe to some extent, some areas in Northern Iraq, but for the most part, it's, this is Assyria, right? For, for most people. And, and in fact, actually for most Assyrians, uh, unless you're familiar with, especially in, let's say, I should say for most Assyrians in the United States, in particular in the modern day, right? The contemporary period in particular, um, Folks, let's say whether you be in the the Midwest in Chicago or or Detroit, or if you are in uh, on the West Coast, um, on in California, whether that be in the Bay Area or in Los Angeles, in any of these cases, most of the Assyrian community is made up largely of people from these areas. Now, I know people will say, "Well, what about the Khabur and other areas?" Well, that too. But again, remember the Khabur in Syria, much of the Khabur, if not all of it, at least in, in modern history, was occupied by Assyrians uh, and, and only really majorly settled in, in let's say, in the, the last, um, in the contemporary period by Assyrians after 
the massacre, the genocide of Samil in 1933. So it, it's still very much Urmi and Haikari. Um, now, of course, this is different when you go outside of the United States. If you go into places like uh, in Sweden or in Germany, if you are in Belgium or Switzerland, then you have a different, you have variously or various different Assyrian communities uh, that exist there. And many of these folks come from places like Turabdin. Now, the folks I'm going to talk about are Assyrians who immigrated from uh, the Middle East. Uh, and I use the term here, you know, Western in sort of in, in partial quotes saying Western Assyrian material culture and language in the early 20th century United States. Western being both Western as in the West, quote unquote, the West, therefore the United States in that sense, but also Western in terms of ecclesiastical designation, also Western in terms of usage of Assyrian script, which would be the probably most in most cases, the, the Serto or the Jacobite script. And, and ecclesiastically, these are mostly members of what was originally in English term, the Assyrian Apostolic Church of Antioch, then became the Assyrian Orthodox Church of Antioch, and is to, well, then I went, then through, went through another period, actually, as the Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch, and is today more commonly known as the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch. Um, and I'm going to focus on Assyrians from mostly the region of Harput uh, and a little bit from Diyarbakir. Uh, both of these places are in today's Turkey, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a second. So um, now, what are my what are my goals or what are we going to talk about today? Why is this important? Um, well, there's two things I want to do. One is I want to talk about the importance of material culture for understanding Assyrian communities. Uh, if we don't have the material culture, then it becomes very difficult to transmit the information to a new generation. So folks in Chicago wouldn't know about these communities unless these communities were interacting with them, right? Now, what ends up happening with the communities that I'm going to be talking about, and for all intents purposes, they almost sort of freeze in time uh, because there's not a replenishment from the uh, from the places that they came from. Harput and Diyarbakir were more or less emptied of Assyrians. So you don't have that continuous process of immigration that came from those areas to the United States. And so the material culture is very important for understanding. Um, and then, of course, the specifics of, of what we can learn or what we learn from them. And I'll talk about that in a second. I'll, I'll uh, go into it in more detail. And then another piece of all this is, of course, storytelling through material culture. Um, what we have in the material culture, just like sort of an archaeologist would do, we have material that we take, we look at this material, and then we have to tell a story, you know, create a tale about it. And what's nice about telling the tales is largely these tales can be told because we have the information from sometimes the oral history that exists, right, that's been passed down or the ethnographic work that's being done by um, scholars or even members of the Assyrian community itself. So um, the importance of storytelling, using the material culture to tell a story and how that helps. Because at, at the end of the day, and this is something I, I hope everyone, you know, could sort of uh, start to understand, is that uh, this material culture and the, the oral history, the ethnography, all of this, what it does or what it becomes is really a bulwark against eradication. You know, with communities like the Assyrians who are who have been marginalized, who are and have been minoritized and are an indigenous people, and this goes for many, many other, or if not every indigenous people and every marginalized and, and minoritized group, um, storytelling largely is what allows or creates a bulwark against this disappearance or this eradication. So. Uh, that's very, very important for us to understand as we move forward. Now, typically, here's a great uh, example of how a lot of this works. So here's a piece of material culture. Now, this is not material culture necessarily from the Assyrian community, but this is material culture from, um, well, about Assyrians, but of course, uh, from the United States Census. This is the United States Census, 1930. Um, and what I wanted to draw everyone's attention to is this area right here, where you have, um, you can see actually the Jacob here, the name Jacob. Uh, and if you go across Jacob here, you can see 
um, place of birth uh, of the person, of the mother, of the father. And if you look at Jacob, you see Persia, Persia. Um, and eventually here you see language spoken at home, you can see Assyrian. And then if you move up a little bit and you see the Joseph family, this large family all here, uh, you can see again um, Persia. You can see for those in Chicago, you can see Illinois for some folks here. These are some of the children um, and some, uh, well, actually all the children of, of, of Sam Joseph here, who's the head of the family. And you can see again, uh, mother also born in Persia for the most part. And then here you can see uh, language spoken at home, Assyrian, 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 Assyrian. Um, this is typically what Assyrians in, in the United States uh, know about the Assyrians in the United States, but also the Assyrians in general. This is, this is sort of the tale of Assyrians of, uh, of the United States. If you take a whole bunch of young folks, uh, young Assyrians, and you ask them, you know, where are the centers of Assyrian uh, settlement in the U.S.? Well, they'd probably say Chicago. They might say, you know, Flint, Michigan. If they are, you know, some, know some of the history. They might say Detroit. They might say Turlock, Modesto, Los Angeles. Yeah, sure, certainly. And here's a great example. Here's the 1930s. Um, but these are typically people from, in this case, this is largely the, the, the Ormia, Lake Ormia region, um, and you'd see something similar for folks from the Hikari region. So this is typically when people go looking for the Assyrians, especially diaspora uh, scholars or scholars of diaspora history, they go looking for Assyrians. These are the Assyrians they typically go looking for. And these are the Assyrians they typically find. Now, one thing I wanted to draw everyone's attention to is one thing you'll notice here. If you see, uh, I have to laugh about this frequently because it's, you know, laughter is a wonderful cure to frustration. Um, when you see language spoken at home, do you notice how it says Assyrian and then it's crossed out and says Syrian? So keep keep this piece uh, handy in your memory because you'll notice this happens frequently. Um, you see this not just with Assyrians from Persia, you see with, with Assyrians from Turkey as well. And you'll see that as we go through. Now, what that means, I don't know. We can talk about that later. Um, Robert and I had a brief discussion with Sarah about it. I don't know if that means that uh, they simply said, well, there's no such thing as Assyrian. And so they, uh, the this is, of course, the census taker. Then they wrote Syrian at the top. I'm not 100% sure about this, but we can talk a little bit more about it as we, we go along. But these are the Assyrians that people typically think of. These are the ones that you typically don't think of. Now, here's an example of some of the people I look at. This is Joseph Denha, who's from High Park, Massachusetts, not far from where I live, where I reside right now. Um, it's probably about 10 minutes away from where I am. Uh, this is Joseph Denha. Joseph Denha, if you look here and you can see this is his declaration for intention uh, to become a U.S. citizen. You can see here that, you know, of course, his residence. But notice here where it says race. He has written Assyrian. And this is typically where you would see, I suppose, where you you, you could probably think about this as, as sort of an ethnic, ethnocultural identity here. But the, the, the term here that was written was race. He has Assyrian and the nationality Turkish because he had a Turkish passport. Um, now, uh, I was born in Harput, Turkey. And then you can see here the date as well. Um, why is all of this important? Well, it's extremely important because it gives us a little bit of a glimpse into the people. But it also reminds us that, wait a minute, there are these people who are saying that they are Assyrian. They self-identify as Assyrian. They move to High Park, Massachusetts. This is Suffolk County, Massachusetts. So in the East Coast, where I live, and they came from this area, at least many of them came from this area called Harput, Turkey. Um, and many of them were, were buried here as well. Uh, this is Assyrian. These are three gravestones. I just, I have probably, I don't know, 150 of these pictures of different gravestones. Um, these are gravestones from, uh, from Assyrians, uh, both in the past and the present. Um, you can see uh, the Khazar family. This is Ohan and Anna, uh, their dates of birth and their, their passing dates. Um, on the other side, you see Behnam and Maryam, and then Bishara and Elias, again, uh, date of birth and then passing. And, um, and then here in the center, you see the Samuel family. You have, the, uh, you have these Assyrian uh, stars or the star of Shamash. Um, this is Shamosh or Samuel, Samuel. Uh, who passed away in 1998, and his wife, um, 
Seydi uh, or Seydun, her original name was Seydun, um, Donabet Samuel. Uh, I bring this to your attention because this was, um, this is my um, father's aunt. So you can see that here. So the, uh, now here's a little bit more information. I think this is, uh, we'll, you folks will find this interesting. If you can see here the, um, the different families now, it's a little bit tough to see, but the, the Burji family here, uh, here's the head of the family, right? I don't know if you can see the cursor. If you go across here, now here's another example. Now these aren't Assyrians from Harput, but this is again, um, a 1920 cents. So 10 years before some of the ones I showed you already. This is a 1920 census. And here, this is the Burji family. And the family hails from Diyarbakir, which is the other uh, place of early immigration that Assyrians, let's say West, quote unquote, Western Assyrians came from. So uh, Diyarbakir and Harput. Now Diyarbakir and Harput, I'll show you where they are, they are in a second in Turkey. But um, if you can see, so this is Diyarbakir. And then you can see uh, language Assyrian, Assyrian, uh, Assyrian. So again, all self-identified as Assyrian. Sometimes, again, uh, you'll notice that it'll sometimes say Diyarbakir Assyria, uh, not, not always Diyarbakir Turkey, but uh, um, that happens very frequently. And, and just so you know, there are you have this with Armenians as well. So this is uh, an Armenian family uh, born in Armenia, 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 Armenian, Armenian. Um, so you can see a lot of that. And, and again, even the place of birth will sometimes say Armenia, sometimes Harput, Armenia. The Assyrians of Harput and, and Diyarbakir did the same thing the Armenians did. Some would say Diyarbakir, Turkey, or Harput, Turkey. And then sometimes they would say Harput, Assyria, or Diyarbakir, Assyria. Um, Here's a, a, a good close-up of the Hoyan family. This is a family from 1930 census. Uh, they lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. So the two large areas that Assyrians came to from Harput in Massachusetts, or I should say, well, in Massachusetts, um, the early immigration came in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they focused on Worcester, Massachusetts, which also had a large Ar Ar Armenian community, uh, also from Harput, and Boston and the, the small cities around Boston. And Boston was a focus because hood rubber was here. So there was a major rubber factory. And Worcester was again, also a factory city. So you could find easy work. You didn't necessarily have to know the language. It was an easy place to immigrate to. Many of the Assyrians and Armenians had family members. Some of them intermarried in Harput. Not, not all of course, but some of them did. And those that did also would, would vouch for each other on their citizenship and their immigration documents. So that's why you find a lot of Assyrians and Armenians in Boston and Worcester. Uh, and then many of these Assyrians also went, when they first landed, they went out from Massachusetts and over to California. And actually some of the earliest organizations in the United States that were founded by Assyrians, uh, especially Assyrians from Harput, were actually out in Los Angeles and Fresno. Um, many of the Assyrians in Fresno sort of have immigrated to the, or not immigrated, I should say, uh, amalgamated themselves or, or assimilated within the Armenian community uh, in Fresno, Los Angeles, because it's become a hub for Eastern Assyrians from largely from uh, Iran, from uh, the region of Iran, uh, the old Assyrian community has sort of dissipated over time, but we can talk about that later. But again, here's Francis Emmanuel Hoyan, the head of the family, his wife, Lizzie, daughter, Margaret, uh, other daughter, Mary, and then his two sons, Nimrod Asher Hoyan, um, Nimrod A, and I can show you that it's Asher in a second, and his uh, son Emmanuel, who I actually uh, knew when I was a young child. And you can see here, place of birth of parents, Assyria, place of birth of, of, of wife, father and, and, and uh, mother, Assyria, uh, again, their father or the father's father was born in Assyria, Assyria, mother's father, Assyria, uh, going all the way back. Now, Massachusetts, they had to write Massachusetts because the children were born in Massachusetts. Uh, but also here, the interesting thing, it said that the language spoken at home is Assyrian. Now, how do we read this document? Well, one of the things, one of the many, many things I think we can learn about this is that, um, that first and foremost, we have uh, the A and the S crossed out again, which is fascinating, right? Uh, beyond the A and the S being crossed out, we also have the usage of Assyria for the place of birth. Now, they were born in Harput, Turkey. I know that because I have their documentation and we know the families. 
So they were born in Harput, but they wrote Assyria as place of birth. And another interesting thing, the Assyrians of Harput and Diyarbakir, for the most part, some places in and around Diyarbakir did speak the Western dialect of Assyrian. The Assyrians of Harput did not. Most of them in the city of Diyarbakir did not. In Harput, they spoke Armenian and Turkish. So to have this here to say that Assyrian was spoken at home tells us a lot about how they identified and what they wanted the United States to know about them, what they wanted people to know about them, or at least to think about them. Now, where is what am I talking about when I talk about this area? So here's the, the old uh, Akhapotros map of Assyrian regions. Um, this is the area of Mosul here. It's really hard to see the center of it, so I apologize. Uh, this is Orfa or Edessa, uh, Orhai, right? This is the ancient city of, of Orhai. Uh, many Assyrians immigrated from Orfa to Halab, to Aleppo, and then from Aleppo um, out to uh, actually places like Massachusetts uh, and, and other areas. Here's Adiaman, and if you keep going all the way up here, here's Harput or Harput. So this is the edge, sort of the... I always try to explain this is probably as far away as you can get from sort of the, the ancient area of Nineveh, but still be within Assyrian territory. And you can see Lake Van way up at the top here. So these are sort of the, the outskirts of, of Assyrian territory. But this was the area that, that folks at the Paris Peace Conference, especially the group with uh, Hapotros, um, felt to be that territory of, uh, of the Assyrians. Um, this is an early picture of Harput. This is the town that they lived in. Uh, you can see here written in the Sirtos, what's sometimes called the Sirtos script um, of Western Assyrian. Um, this is Mariaman uh, Akilisesi, right? This is the, the St. Mary's Church. This is most, mostly the Assyrians would write, as I said, in their own script, but largely in Ottoman Turkish language. This is the Garshuni, or sometimes also in Armenian. And we'll see a little bit more of that. But this is the what, what was left of the town of Harput, the Assyrian, or this, and this is specifically the Assyrian quarter. This area is the uh, the Church of St. Mary. Um, and here is their church again, uh, the Bishop's Quarters, and here is the church. Um, uh, the last time I was there was in 2003, so 20 years ago. Um, and this area still exists. The church still exists. It's been uh, sort of re uh, renovated to an extent, but the rest of the town is, is completely gone uh, after the genocide. Um, so... Just to go back to to show some how this works again with the Diyarbakir community, because I'm going to focus mostly on on Harput. Um, this is a piece of material culture from from the Diyarbakir community. So this is the Assyrian Apostolic Church of the Virgin Mary. Now, again, most most Assyrians today and, and most scholars, when they identify Assyrians of the or sometimes call them West Syrians, West Syriacs, Syriacs. Assyrians today will, even Assyrians do this when they say there are Assyrians, there's Chaldeans, and there are Syriacs. Um, it, it's a hugely problematic way of defining everyone, and it's completely not, uh, it's not an indigenous uh, internal response. This is something that's sort of been imposed on the community and then the community adopted. Um, but this is the Assyrian Church of the Virgin Mary. These are quote-unquote Jacobites. These are quote-unquote Syriac Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox. This church still exists today. It's still called the Assyrian Apostolic Church of the Virgin Mary. It's the only Jacobite church that's still, to the best of my knowledge, that's still called Assyrian today in English. Um, it's interesting also in the Assyrian at the top, if you can read the script, it says, Aito shli haito. So this is the apostolic, right? So the apostolic church, the, the Morth Mariam, right? So of St. Mary, right? Rather than what's typical among Jacobites, which is Yoldath Aloho, right? The, uh, the, the bearer of God, right? The Theotokos in Greek. Um, and then here, um, the Othoroye, Tris Shubho, right? Tris Shubho is what you think of as Orthodox today. But here, the Othoroye, like of the Assyrians, and they use the term Othoroye rather than Suroye or Suryoye, both common terms uh, used. But early enough on, this term, uh, this script, and this particular nomenclature was also utilized. So this is from 1959. Um, and these are some of the families, the Bakal family, this is the Red Venli family, um, the, the Mazaji family, and the Kadersha family. So these are very, very uh, common uh, Diyarbakirli names, Dartley, of course, is a famous name. 
Um, the Joseph family and the Better Beds are all very well-known Diyarbakirli families. Now, these are all Assyrians who immigrated right around the same time as the Assyrians from Harput, late 19th, early 20th century. Mostly went to, um, as you can see here, West New York, New Jersey. So um, these folks uh, still, uh, now today there are six, seven, eight churches, Jacobite churches in New Jersey, I think at this point. Um, so it's a center for Jacobites, but most today do not use the term Assyrian. They don't self-identify as Assyrian. The older generation mostly have passed on and some still utilize it, but not, not all. So to go back to the Harput community and to show that there was connections with other folks, here's a famous Harput Assyrian. This is uh, Abraham K. Yusuf, who went to the Paris Peace Conference with Dr. Joel Werda, who was a, a famous Assyrian known for a variety of things um, and was definitely well known among Assyrians in Chicago. Uh, for his work on various magazines, his writing, but also for his work with the Paris Peace Conference. Um, but it's interesting, you notice while these folks are, they have uh, uh, Yuval Warda or Joel Warda, you notice that this all is done in the Western script. So this is Moth, Moth Othur, right, the land of Assyria. Um, this area here, you can see, um, you can see the standard here. This is one of the old standards of the Assyrians. This was uh, a standard that I found in many old houses that I would go into uh, when I was doing my ethnographic and oral history work. Um, and you can see the Assyrian coat of arm uh, or arms and mother Assyria designed by the Assyrian Five Association. And here is the other example of the Assyrian Five. And here is a booklet from the Assyrian Five um, in, of Boston, Massachusetts. These are all Assyrians from Harput. Um, and this these pieces of material culture this has been translated and and we hope to send out the actually the the translation very very soon most of this was actually about asher yusuf the um the very well-known uh famous assyrian writer of harput uh who who was the head editor of uh and writer of murshid Athuriun out of harput and this association was started in 1917. 1917 the assyrian five association of boston shotha putha right to do the eastern script well to to read it in a Srangeli, but eastern uh, dialect um uh or pronunciation this is shotha putha tramsha the authorae be boston right now interestingly this was done in 1919 two years after its founding here's the original stamp right here you see suryoya tramsho right in this in the western script they used the terms Suryaya, Suryoyo, uh, Athuraya, Othuroyo interchangeably. Had no problem with it. And sometimes you see this earlier than 1917. And sometimes you see Suryoye um, at the same time. They had no qualms with using one or the other. Now that, of course, we would not know unless we had this material culture. This is one of the wonderful things about that. The other thing it tells us is, well, it's interesting here. You have Armenian. Now, why would you have Armenian there? Well, you had the Armenian because most of the Assyrians that this was written for were Assyrians of Harput, um, maybe some Diyarbakirli Assyrians as well, who used Armenian as a first language at this point. Now, why that was the case, we don't know. We do know the Assyrians lost uh, Assyrian and Harput um, pretty early on, at least 100 years prior to this, probably, uh, according to the people that I interviewed, but we're not exactly sure when it disappeared. Uh, the other piece that's interesting is the Assyrian Five. So I don't know how true this is, but the oral history that I received that the Assyrian Five were actually the first five Assyrians of Harput who came to the United States. There were five men who came in the, the late uh, 1800s and they moved together and they lived in a particular area in Massachusetts and they had one apartment and they basically worked to bring their families. Um, and they started this association, right? It was basically built off of their friendship and their work, and then they created a larger Assyrian uh, association from it. But how true this is, whether or not it's, I, I don't know 100% if that was the case, but that was the most of the oral history that I received on it. So let me see if I can go to the next. Oops. Okay. There we go. Um, here are just some examples of, of Assyrians, uh, one of the great things that we have from the Harput community in Massachusetts is they had tons of writing. And in almost all of their writing, what's fascinating is that they're writing mostly in the Western script, Western Assyrian script. Uh, this is Ottoman Turkish. 
the language that's being used is Ottoman Turkish. Um, and what's fascinating is uh, they, they didn't just write prayers, which is also a very common thing. And you find that among Eastern Assyrians from Urmi, Haikari, you know, from Iraq, uh, early immigrants would write little prayer books and things like that. Pretty much all of these folks did that. I have prayer, uh, have prayer, prayer books in my collection uh, from many, many people from Harput. But you also have songs and poetry, um, which is really fascinating. So these are some pieces uh, that, that are sort of mixed together. Um, this is Estefan. I'm not exactly sure. I thought this might be Tasho or Dasho or Tashji. Uh, I'm not 100% sure what that last one is supposed to um is, is supposed to this last name is supposed to be but uh in any case the the fact is that we have this really fascinating um connection of assyrian uh usage of garshuni um to write sometimes for note taking and a variety of other things here's an example of a prayer booklet though this was written in assyrian script um and again you have the assyrian script and then you have prayers on one side and this i took a picture of this particular segment here because this Assyrian of Harput actually had this really great piece here, which became a song, or this was a song. And this is the song or the poem, Beth Nahrein. Beth Nahrein i i mothen, right? Um, this is the Likto'ino lech adham al So uh, this is in classical, what's considered classical Syriac or Ktobonoyo or Lishanit. Lishana Atiqa, depending on how you would think about it, but fascinating that we have uh, some classical also being used by the community. Some of them would have studied a bit of it, but most lay people would not have known this. Uh, but you see that in the, again, this is someone born in Harput, raised in Massachusetts. Here are some other pieces of the poems. Um, uh, Beth Nahrein i Arod Author. So you can see some of this here, um, uh, Beth Nahrein, right? The uh, the land of Assyria. So uh, Mesopotamia, the land of Assyria. So you, you can see how they used a variety of different things. And the fact that they were writing poetry about their land, as well as writing uh, um, uh, blessings or prayers, um, showed you sort of what was interesting to these folks when they came to the United States. Um, remember early on, I showed you the picture of uh, the census of the Hoyan family. Well, here is the Hoyan family, or at least one member of it. This is um, Nimrod Asher Hoyan's Assyrian Patriotic Song. And he uh, composed this in 1924 with uh, Nelson Williams. So the music was done by Williams, the words by Nimrod Asher Hoyan. And uh, here are the, the pieces of it. This is uh, the name of Assyria be known to every man once again, uh, or uh, I should say, remember we are Christians and the those of the first to be. Um, and then you can see rem, uh, uh, on this, the second part here, uh, there's a refrain as well. Oops, oh, went too far. Um, but in any case, uh, the, the fact that you have even the second generation, so the first generation to be born in the United States writing these uh, songs and poems and connection to the homeland, to the heartland, to Nineveh. I mean, these are Assyrians from Harput. These people are far away from Nineveh as you can get while still being Assyrian in many ways um, and be in, the, be in Assyrian territory. Uh, and they still had this sort of sense of centering Nineveh. So that tells us a lot about um, the people, right? And the fact that they felt Harput was, was important to them, but also, you know, the other areas of Assyria. Um, Here's a great piece uh, of, again, of, of Assyrians uh, from um, Massachusetts. So you can see down here, published in Boston, Massachusetts, Shamadav uh, still exists. And this is Babylon. This is the, um, the, the newspaper or the, the pamphlet Babylon. And as you can see, uh, all of this was done in Armenian. I mean, with the exception of a few Assyrians who could, uh, uh, most Assyrians from Harput, I should say, that lived in Massachusetts could read and write Assyrian script, but they were much more comfortable in either Ottoman Turkish or Armenian. And so you can see all of this on the front is done in Armenian and pretty much everything internally as well. But even though things were done in Armenian, the fact is, and that was for reading purposes, you know, as people would use English today, 
the point was that they were still publishing on their culture. Uh, and here's Dr. A.K. Yusuf here, Sons of Assyria. This is one of the famous pictures that some of you may have seen from one of my works or someone else's works. Um, this is one of the first pictures I found when I went looking for uh, material from families. Um, this is a 4th of July parade in 1920s. Uh, here it is again. So the the earlier one is um, is them walking in the parade in Worcester, Massachusetts. This is Worcester, Massachusetts Main Street. Uh, again, 19, 1920s, 1922. And this is the old Assyrian flag that you saw that standard of. This is red, white, and purple. And um, this sign here, Sons of Assyria. So even that first generation that came, even while they were trying to intermingle with the, in, the, uh, the Americans and assimilate into the culture and be very American, they still stood out as Assyrians. They had no qualms with still, you know, at a time period where really everyone tried to assimilate, the fact that they stood out so much is actually quite remarkable. You know, um, I find that to be very, very interesting and tells us a lot about the people and what they found to be important. This is um, A.K. Yusuf and his sister and his sister's family. Um, this is the grand opening of the church, the first church in Massachusetts. This was uh, the, the St. Mary's Church named after St. Mary's in Harput. Um, this is the uh, St. Mary's uh, Assyrian Apostolic Church. You can still actually see Assyrian Church here. Um, here was the old Assyrian flag that they utilized. So before the uh, the modern Assyrian flag that you see, here's the American flag on the left side here. And if you notice, here's religious figure, here's religious figure, the patriarch and, and the bishop. And right in the between here um, should be a picture of uh, Abraham Yusuf. Um, here is another great one, uh, the early community of, of uh, Assyrians in Massachusetts, 19, 1897, Assyrian Benevolent Association, uh, 1897. So this is one of the, the earliest um, organizations that was established in the United States for Assyrians by Assyrians. Um, the, uh, this is Dr. A.K. Yusuf right here. Again, the person who went to the Paris Peace Conference, the one in that parade I just showed you. Um, this is K.S. Malikian, who is an Armenian photographer that did most of the photography for the Assyrians and Armenians in Worcester, Massachusetts. This is from 1914. And what's interesting, again, I mean, you can see some of these classical traditional instruments the Assyrians would get together for uh, picnics, but also the fact that largely it's mostly men here um, or all men. But we do know that the establishment of 1897 was quite early. So the fact that they were around for so long meant that they saw a need for Assyrians to be taken care of in the homeland. Um, now, what else can we learn from this material culture? Well, the fact that there was uh, Assyrians had bought land in Massachusetts uh, that they dedicated to be a camp. And they called that camp, as you can see up here, Camp Nineveh. Camp Nineveh, this is a picture from 1948. Um, these are three Assyrians. Uh, I know this one. This is that the the uh, the woman in the the gravestone um Sadie Samuel Sadie Donabet Samuel this is my great aunt uh and this again is another picture from 1965 so these are folks uh, as they've sort of aged from that first generation who came to the United States this is Camp Nineveh June 26 1965 um this is uh George Keshish who is actually the cousin of David Perley who you see in a second um uh, this is uh, Abdanur Safer or Safer, and uh, this is actually Yohanna Donabed. And the reason I know him is that's actually my grandfather. Um, and not only did they have picnics, but so fascinatingly, this is the Jacobite community, right? Remember that. This is a Jacobite community. These are Assyrian Apostolic Church of Antioch folk, okay? in Massachusetts in 1926, July 4th picnic, okay? Now, what were they doing? The Harput Assyrian United Association of America, so we know they had another association. This was an outing honoring Lady Surma de Beit Marshamun. So, and who do you have right here in the center? This is Lady Surma. So many of you are uh, familiar with Lady Surma, and Surma is very well known for being the patriarch's aunt, uh, sort of a mover and shaker, and the patriarch, I mean, the Patriarch of the Church of the East at the time. Uh, this is um, uh, Marben Yaman Shem'un. 
uh, and the, of course, uh, Mar'isha Shamun. So this is Mar'isha Shamun's aunt. And what's fascinating here is that the fact that they are honoring Lady Surma meant that their ecclesiastical issues at the time, and this is one, so this is the Assyrian community in Harput, from Harput in Massachusetts. There is one exactly the same as this. Now, this is a large uh, roll-up picture. I, I don't have the, I, I mean, I could pull it around for you. You could see it uh, later if someone wants to see the larger one. But um, there's one exactly the same as this. I believe 100% sure that there was one in Los Angeles, also by Assyrians of Harput also honoring Surma, and I believe one in New Jersey as well. So the fact that they did not have an issue with their ecclesiastical differences is fascinating, or at least if they had issues that they could come together and look beyond it, that they still saw each other as one, uh, one holistic people is very important. Um, I'm gonna go through these last few fairly quickly. I don't wanna take up anyone's time. I know folks wanna get going uh, and have a little bit for question and answer, but this is probably the most famous Assyrian of Harpa. This is David Barsum Perley, David Barsum Keshish Perley. Um, uh, Keshish was the name most people knew him by. And these are some of his uh, original notes. So he wrote some original notes here, um, which is really fascinating. This is some of the stuff that we found uh, back in the day when uh, I had worked with uh, Tomas uh, Beth of Dalla. Um, of Nineveh Press, who was collecting a lot of material for the MARA, the Modern Assyrian Research Archive, much of which is now being uh, utilized by and uh, on the server of the Assyrian Studies Association. So if you're interested in that, please go there. But now the fact that we have all of this, I mean, we, we, we don't have a lot of the information on uh, Asher Yusuf's family, but strangely, here is a whole bunch of information written in his, uh, in, in, uh, sort of a contemporary, a little later though, David Perley's handwriting about Asher Yusuf, because Asher Yusuf was such a giant among the Assyrians at the time period um, that folks like Perley would have known all of his details, at least as intimately as anyone else. Um, this is just really fascinating. It's another piece of material culture, not because of its really strange um, circumstance. We, the undersigners, demand the Assyrian Apostolic Church Committee of Worcester Massachusetts, uh, we demand the resignation of the present priest, Pablo Samuel, for the reasons uh, his condition forces us to take this, his, this action. Now, they don't say exactly why, but really interesting. Um, this is the Assyrian. These are all a bunch of Assyrians from Harput. Why is this fascinating? Because we learned a lot about their last names. We can, uh, you know, at least find their family names. We do know that there were some issues. They asked a priest to resign. Um, we knew some were writing in Assyrian, some were not, but here we, we have also, and we also know that some of them had Armenized first names, like uh, Khachadur. I mean, that's about as uh, 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 typically Armenian as you can get, um, yet still this person was an Assyrian. So you can see those Assyrians from Harput, some had very typical Armenian names, um, whereas others did not. They had very typically Assyrian names. Uh, the Elbag family, Ohan, Hoyan, uh, obviously the, the Sheen meme is uh, Shamosho, Sham, Shamasha. Uh, so you can see that. These are all the, the Shamoshe. Um, again, the Perch family, the Barsum family, the Yusuf family, the Manug family. These are all the Safar family, Papa's family, Elbi. These are all very common uh, Harput Assyrians. Um, you can see here again, perch, and this is sort of the, the end of it. And here's the original, one of the original stamps of the church. So again, fascinating. You have the, uh, um, the English script, you have the date, and then you have the establishment of the church, 1923. And then you have the Assyrian script. Um, now this one is really fascinating because remember how I said the church in New Jersey said, uh, this one actually says, uh, Aloho. So they actually use mother of God in this one, which is not very typical of um, that time period. Um, we know they had the women were involved. This is the uh, Assyrian um, uh, Ladies Association of the Church. This is 1908, so it's quite early. They didn't even have an established or a built church at the time. In fact, they mostly utilized the Episcopal Church. Uh, if this Now, this is in, in Worcester. A lot of times they would use Episcopal churches. 
So in, in Watertown, Massachusetts, which is near Boston, they use the Episcopal Church. I, I believe in Worcester they did as well. Um, but this is from 1915, again, um, taken by the Malikian Studio. Um, this is a Halloween dance one. I don't want to go through that. Uh, and that this is an older one. Uh, this is actually an Ikami from the Ottoman Empire, which we can go back to later. But the last two I wanted to show were these. Um, this is really fascinating because uh, it has uh, a couple of things that stood out to me. One, this is my grandfather, my great aunt in the picture, brother and sister. And this is Malcolm Donabet, who must have been a, some a rela a relation of ours. Uh, but what's really fascinating is this, too. Not only was the name an Assyrian name, not only was the family connected here, um, but they also had a sense of pride in it. So, so these were folks who became entrepreneurs. These were folks who uh, not just uh, became part of a community and stayed Assyrian, but they integrated, right? These were people who attempted to become uh, uh, just part of the American community as well, while also maintaining an Assyrian identity. So all of this is extremely important for us to learn or, or how much we can learn about the Assyrians of Harput. So, oops, sorry, let me see if I could go back to this. Um, now, why is all of this that I just told you important? As I said, well, what does it allow us to do? Well, it allows us to look at Assyrians in a different way and understand Assyrian community as, as communities, not just people in Chicago and in California, not just Detroit, not just uh, the typical places that we think of Assyrians. It allows us to think outside of the box about how we use terms like Assyrians, Chaldeans, and Syriacs, because none of these people would have used the term Syriac, and they are all what most people would now quote, say, quote unquote, are Syriacs. None of them would have used the term Syriac for their identity, nor for their language, okay? They would have used Assyrian only. Um, all of these people were Assyrians who did not speak any dialect of Assyrian for the most part. They may have learned a little bit of Ktobonoyo, right? Church ecclesiastical or, or uh, um, I should say uh, liturgical Assyrian um, or classic, what's called classical Syriac sometimes, but not by any stretch of the imagination were these people that would use that term. They Everything in their minds was Assyrian. And in fact, um, there was a, a song that was typically sung among these Assyrians, and it was done in Armenian. And I, it was something along the lines of, and, and I always butcher it because my Armenian is very poor, but it was something along the lines of Asuri Yemyez, Asuri Vortim. And it meant something like Assyrian, I will live and Assyrian, I die, right? Uh, and, and it's interesting because to say that in a foreign language or a language that wasn't the language of the Assyrians at the time or at the, or, you know, for these Assyrians that had immigrated to, to Massachusetts largely um, is I think a uh, very telltale of how they saw themselves, despite the fact that they had these, com these various communities that they were a part of, right. They had a connection to the Armenians in Harput. They had a connection to the, the, the area of Turkey that they had come from and the Turkish language and Ottoman language. Um, they had a connection to the, to the United States and they had connections to Assyrians, right? Other Assyrians from other regions, from Diyarbakir, from Urmi, from uh, places like uh, Haikari, uh, with people like Joel Werda. All of these things were things that were very common and happening in the early 20th century. And things most Assyrians and most scholars, I should say, uh, academics also know very little about. And if folks are interested in knowing more about this, I'm happy to help. The Assyrians of Eastern Massachusetts book talks a lot about this. Um, Ruth Camber's Assyrians in uh, Yonkers uh, has uh, some great stuff on Eastern Assyrians and, and material culture in Yonkers. Um, there's, of course, the two by uh, Vasily Shimunov in Chicago uh, for Assyrians in Chicago. And uh, Megan um, uh, Betenvia, who did a book on Assyrians of New Britain. Um, all of these pieces are really wonderful ways of sort of keeping alive a culture or cultures that are sort of end up being frozen in time because what ends up happening in the present is we don't typically carry them through, right? We know general stories, we have some information, but then they become dominant parts of our history, dominant parts. And when I say our, I mean every human being's history that simply become what we typically connect with, right? Assyrian is this. Assyrian is Iraq. Assyrian is Haikari and Urmi. Assyrian is...